um, and uh, it's great to have him in our presence. So he, he and I actually go way back when I was a beginning graduate student uh, at Berkeley. He was a visiting instructor uh, from UCLA, and, uh, and I've looked up to him ever since. So it's really a pleasure uh, to have him here on this occasion. So the Laudatio, the praise poem, will be given by Hartmut Arbalant um, of Roskilde University of Denmark and co-founder of the uh, Journal of Pragmatics, who therefore well positioned to understand Larry's place in pragmatic history, as it were, um, and I hand over to him now. In 2017, 2019, and 2021, IPRA awarded its first John J. Gumpert's Lifetime Achievement Awards to Sandra A. Thompson of UC Santa Barbara, Elizabeth Traugott of Stanford University, and Deborah Tan of Georgetown University, respectively. In 2021, a special award, the IPRA Award for Foundational Service in the Field of Pragmatics, went to Jakob L. May, in time before he died in February this year at the age of 96. Today, IPRA will present the fourth John J. Gumpers Lifetime Achievement Award to Lawrence or Larry Horn of Yale University in 2022. Larry Horn was one of the first people to thoroughly explore the linguistic implications of H.P. Price's theory of implicature. Nearly all the work on implicature builds on this foundational efforts. His pioneering work has shown how Gricean principles are sometimes in tension with one and how this tension is often systematically resolved. In doing so, he has shown how this tension plays out on both or, sorry, how this tension plays out both on the semantics pragmatics interface and on the syntax pragmatics interface. One of his major contributions has been in showing how pragmatic forces shape the lexicon, blocking some lexicalizations while allowing others. Diary's book, A Natural History of Negation, is a monumental contribution to linguistic theory, building on its insights into how pragmatic principles shape the conventionalized expressions in any language. It's a deeply learned book, full of insights into language use and language structure, and surveys a vast body of thought from Aristotle to the present on the functional expression of negation and its marked and complex character. In doing so, Larry shows how his two Q and R principles in opposition shape many details of language structure and use and constrain the directions of language change. His work is outstanding also in the sense that he shows a keen interest in the history of our discipline and its philosophical underpinnings. Larry's large body of work represents the greatest contribution from any single scholar to understanding the way in which pragmatic forces interact with core linguistic structure and meaning. He has contributed, contributed fundamental concepts to our discipline like scalar implicature, metalinguistic negation, neo gricean pragmatics, privative lexical diets, auto hyponymy and many others. In addition to these highly original contributions, Larry has done important service to the pragmatics community by editing a series of handbooks in pragmatics. He is Professor Emeritus at Yale University, and in 2021, he was the president of the Linguistic Society of America. In May of this year, uh, a satellite session to SAW 33 at Yale University, a workshop was organized with the title Diachronies of Negation, which really was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Larry's PhD from UCLA, for which he wrote the thesis on the semantic properties of logical operators in English. Even his advisor, Barbara Patti, was present, and this is quite a feat, I'd say, People are celebrated for all kinds of reasons, but this is the first time I heard of a celebration of the 50th anniversary of anybody's PhD thesis. 
But I may add here that his 1972 dissertation was foreshadowed in 1971 by contribution to the famous or infamous Macaulay Festschrift by an author, uh, by a contribution authored by Dr. Forthcoming Larry Horn. Note the Dr. Forthcoming, which indeed it was in 1971. I only recently found out that the larynx actually has horns. Larry, of course, knew that. I don't know whether you can read this text. If not, uh, the text is available. Uh, shall I leave it there for a moment? Or Okay. Text is available or accessible at uh, address or also in printed form. So anybody who wants to read that and enjoy it again can go there. Also, uh, for all of you who want to read an account by Larry himself about his intellectual biography, I recommend an article in the Annual Review of Linguistics, which is available online too. I met Larry for the first time in 2009 in Kyoto, where we both gave keynote papers at the annual meeting of the Pragmatic Society of Japan and later at the two first AMPRA meetings of American Pragmatics in uh, Charlotte and uh, Los Angeles. When we engaged in discussion of the connection between the principle of the excluded middle, the philosophy of Parmenides and the fight against matriarchy in Greek religion, I realized how broad Larry's range of interest and knowledge was. I regard him as very worthy of the award he has given today. Thank you, Hartman. So, Larry, can you come up now? Yeah. And um, I'm going to call on, oh, yes, there you are. Did I take that one? No. Well, all right. Um, so, I'm going to call on Jenny Cook Gumperts, who has sponsored this award, um, to award it. Yes. <laughs> Very happily, we have her here. Um, I think you have to. You can come to this microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Me. Well, um, it gives me great pleasure to give you this award, Ooh. which is an amazingly heavy piece of. <laughs> what would you say? Steel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say. <laughs> And this is the box. Titanium. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is the box. You'll need to take it out. Uh, It'll make every Both piece of machinery the, in the right at the airport, airport. Of screening. Yes, yes, I will yes. explain this. So, thank you. Is this a map of Antarctica? Do you think? It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all of the middle. Yes. Yeah, it's the galaxy. The galaxy. Yeah. Pragmatic. Black. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. Jenny. Oh, I'm going to miss you. Yeah. I'm right on top of the screen. I can uh, see it. Je Jenny and I uh, just discovered that we didn't meet in 1970, 71 uh, in Berkeley, uh, but uh, it's it's nice to make up for that. So thank you very much, uh, everyone at IPRA, who is responsible for this award. Thank you, Hartmut, for that wonderful um introduction and summary. I'd forgotten the uh, well done, uh, so that was nice to be reminded of that. And uh, I guess you'll be hearing from me enough that I don't need to prolong my remarks. So thank you very much, and thank you to Steve, Mr. President. Uh, as Steve says, we, uh, we go way back, and I will uh, illustrate that uh, very shortly. So, <laughs> good. Okay, so Larry, thank you very much. And um, uh, I, I will share this uh, meeting, but uh, Larry will um, just give the talk, I hope. Um, oh, do. His, um, his talk is entitled, The Grand Tug of War, Clarify Economy and Expressivity Across the Ages. I'm going to be taking us all on a very rapid journey through a couple thousand years um, 
not starting a couple thousand years ago, uh, but uh, going back there and then coming back into the present. And um, what I will be talking about is the, um, the tug of war between uh, informativity and economy or cost overlaid by the role of expressivity or extravagance in language. Um, and so this is a way of kind of um, stepping out from the, um, the Q and R distinction, uh, Q and I, if we're speaking in Levinsonian terms, uh, to uh, their, their roots um, as uh, pragmatic principles responsible, as Hartmut touched on, for a lot of what goes on, including lexical and semantic change and lexical choice. Uh, so the basic idea, here's a couple of epigraphs. Uh, uh, first, that the speaker always tries to optimally minimize the surface complexity of utterances while maximizing the amount of information effectively communicated to the listener. Uh, or um, more curtly, maximize meaning, minimize means. So we begin with... Uh, three amigos. On the left is uh, Jay Atlas, who in a sense was a mentor for both Steve and me. In the center is our distinguished president. Um, and on the right, well, the left within the right is me. Uh, the other figure in the foreground there is Ite, my late Samoyed. Um, so this takes us back to the, um, the mid-70s when uh, Steve and I uh, first met, as he mentioned. And so we now move to what you're mostly all familiar with as the Levinsonian heuristics. And I'm focusing on two principles. The two principle, what isn't said isn't. Um, the hearer's corollary is the speaker is assumed to have made the strongest statement consistent with what she knows. And the I principle, what isn't said is obvious. Um, what is simply described as stereotypically identified and from the hearer's perspective, enrich the content of the speaker's utterance up to the point you take to have been intended by the speaker. And notice the color coding, which I hope is showing up, uh, uh, red for I, or as we'll see, R, um, and Q, uh, and, and green for Q. Um, so in my work, I uh, outlined uh, what I called a zipfo um Manichaean model for pragmatics and beyond. Manichaean is that it's a duality rather than a trinity, as in Steve's conception. So we have the Q principle of sufficiency, essentially say enough, and the R, <clears throat> R principle of maximization, uh, of, of minimization, uh, don't say you don't need to, don't say too much. Um, the next... Um, Three amigos we're going to have, people who uh, didn't actually know each other. Well, at least Grice didn't know Zipf and Martinet. Uh, you're familiar with Grice's Maxims of Conversation. In my framework, I uh, have advocated um, leaving aside quality as primordial and preeminent and unreducible. I take the other maxims and submaxims to be. Um, reducible into basically two bags. There's the green bag that gives you the Q, the corollaries of the Q principle, make your contribution as informative as is required, um, avoid ambiguity and obscurity, uh, and the R bag, which ha holds a, a diverse um, assemblage of um, sub-maxims. Don't make your contribution more informative than is required, be relevant, be brief, be orderly. So the Q principle, says make your contribution sufficient, say as much as you can, given both quality and R. Um, the R principle, make your contribution necessary, say no more than you must, given Q. Um, the Q principle is a lower bounding principle inducing upper bounding implicata, in particular scalar implicatures. Um, so if the speaker is supposed to not say what they can't, then they're taken to have uttered the strongest um, uh, assessment they can given quality. Um, the R principle, on the other hand, is responsible for euphemism, um, neg raising, negative strengthening in general, um, and um, uh, conditional perfection, the move from if P then Q to if and only if P Q. 
uh, conjunction buttressing. So this is a lot of the work that on Steve's account uh, is handled by the I principle. Um, I combine Grice here with ZIP. So implicitly, the, du the dualistic system is built on, well, really explicitly, since I said it, on uh, ZIP's two economies. Um, the speaker's economy is a correlate of least effort, uh, which would tend, if unchecked, sort of vocabulary of one word referring to all the M distinct meanings the speaker might have in mind. In here's economy, which tend sort of vocabulary of as many different words as there are meanings, one for each. And the interaction is governed by the law of abbreviation. High frequency is the cause of small magnitude. So there's been a lot of work on this by, I just mentioned Joan Bybee, but a lot of other people who've worked on the role of frequency. So going back, as I promised, a couple of thousand years, the ancient rhetoricians were not unaware of the dialectic between sufficiency and minimization. So for Aristotle, prolixity is defined um, well, the, the interaction of prolixity and its opposite are responsible for the golden mean. Uh, the speaker's contribution is not clear if it's prolix, but it's also not clear if it's curt. Polis defines um, the interaction in verse. Um, Brevis esse laboro, obscurus fio. I strive to be brief, I become obscure. Um, Quintilian defines brevity in terms of not saying less, but not saying more than the occasion demands. It's kind of a weird definition of brevity, but we see what he's after. He's after something broader than just brevity, something that we will later call um, uh, effectiveness. Um, so um, moving ahead back to the 19th century, it wasn't until the diachronic philologists of the 19th century that the trade-off we're discussing was rendered explicitly, beginning with the two Georgs, who identified the two key drives or pressures as Deutlichkeit, clarity or distinctness, versus Bequemlichkeit, ease or convenience. So that's Curtius and Gabelens. Um, so here is Curtius. Language knows how to make compromises in particular, you can read it in German if you prefer, uh, between the demands of clarity and the tendencies toward convenience. Um, and here is Gabelens. Uh, the history of languages moves along the diagonal of two forces, the drive for ease uh, and the drive to distinctness. Um, actually, 100 years earlier, Tetten's uh, uh, described um, uh, a version of Deutlichkeit and Faslichkeit and use them for other purposes. Uh, so moving ahead to a neoclassical triumvirate, um, these are the bad guys that Mark mentioned, or at least a couple of them. So William Dwight Whitney, my predecessor at Yale, stressed the key role of economy of effort in language change, um, constrained by the need to preserve meaning. Economy leads to abbreviation to take a shortcut instead of going around by the usual road unless more is lost than gained. Give up such parts of words as can be spared without detriment to the whole. Um, this is the fundamental law of language, the grand current setting through universal language. Um, this was 1875, around the same time, Powell uh, focused on the role of context or common ground, familiar concepts to pragmaticians, in encouraging or constraining the hearer's economy, the need, as he calls it, everywhere we find modes of expression forced into existence which contain only just so much as is requisite to their being understood. The linguistic material varies in each case with the situation, the previous conversation, the relative approximation of the speakers to a common state of mind. And Jesperson um, explored these two opposite tendencies affecting language change in terms of a tug of war between speaker-oriented ease or economy of effort, he actually uh, mentions Corpius's Bequemlichkeit here, um, and community-oriented curbing factors that resist innovation. Here's a, an illustration a bit earlier of the tug of war. Not sure which side is which here. Um, so Westerson writes, the tendency toward ease may be at work in some cases, though not in all, because there are other forces which may neutralize it or prove stronger than it. 
Um, 20 years later, Jesperson returns to the scene of the tug of war, uh, the interplay of two opposite tendencies, one toward ease, the other toward distinctness. The former is the tendency to take things easy, follow the line of least resistance, an outcome of human indolence and laziness. And then he goes on in this vein for a while. Um, the opposite tendency is an effort to be clearly and precisely understood. On human indolence and laziness, um, we can hark back to Whitney, who warns about how economy can easily turn into laziness if we're not careful. And Sace talks about the role of laziness or least effort in word meaning, syntax, and phonology. Um, Femlichkeit itself um, might be best rendered as laziness with a distinct moralizing tone, as Torsten uh, Zander puts it, rather than simply as ease or economy. But we can also see least effort as a natural driver impulse without demeaning it as an unfortunate sign of our flawed humanity or animality, since animals too, mammals, for instance, obey uh, least effort in all sorts of ways, including burying a bone, digging deep enough, but not too deep. Alternatively, we can reappropriate laziness without its moralizing character, as with Kirshner's marketness constraint, lazy which oper operationalizes the speaker's tendency to minimize articulatory effort. Um, uh, so violations of lazy are based on its effort cost, a mental estimate of the biomechanical energy required for articulatory production. Phonologists have often invoked the dynamic tension between the two functional principles. Uh, so speaker-oriented least effort, which would tend toward the minimization of the movement of articulators um, and um, the hero-oriented counterforce tending toward a maximization of salience and perceptual discriminability. So a lot of this is not new. I'm just trying to put together things from that have been known for really thousands of years in different ways. Um, Lindblom and Madison uh, in functionalist phonology uh, describe consonant systems as evolving so as to achieve maximum perceptual, perceptual distinctiveness at minimum articulatory cost, Hayes writes, uh, that virtually all of segmental phonology is driven by considerations of articulatory ease and perceptual distinctness. If this is a tug of war, who's doing the pulling? For Zip, we have the speaker's economy of force of unification, placing an upper bound on the form of the message. The hearer's economy or force of diversification places a lower bound on its content. Now, today, picked up the dialectic where Zip left off. Um, in order to understand how language changes, a linguist has to keep in mind two antinomic factors, the requirements of communication, the need for the speaker to convey his message, uh, and second, the principle of least effort, which makes him restrict his output of energy. We'll come to the rest of the Malpinet quote later. So uh, are we dealing here then with two antinomic factors, as I suggested, or is there really just one unitary principle? So. For Grice, there's clearly the two halves, who's the maximum of quantity, which my Q and R play off uh, in my Manichaean program. Um, we have the same conceptions with those epigraphs. Uh, but others have considered a kind of monistic approach where the two halves are put together. So uh, Karsten, working within relevance theory, where there's really just one principle of optimal relevance, at the same time, talks about how human cognitive activity it's driven by the cost of maximizing relevance that is to derive as great a range of contextual effects as possible for the least expenditure of effort. This does characterize language. I'm not sure it characterizes relevance in the pre-theoretical sense, and that's a point that Steve made in his review back in 89 of uh, Sperber and Wilson's book. Uh, or we can think about Quintilian's notion of brevity, not saying less but not saying more than the occasion demands. Well, that's not really brevity. It's a single principle, perhaps, that plays off the interaction of these two balancing forces, counterbalancing forces, but it's not really brevity any more than its relevance. Asakashir is perhaps closer with this principle of effective means. Choose that action which most effectively and at least cost attains that uh, and ceteris paribus, and here are other people who've said something similar in their own framework. So Rosh, working within prototype theory, talks about category systems as providing maximum information with the least cognitive effort. 
Hertz talks about individual speakers striking a balance between maximum effect and minimum effort. He, I think, somewhat unhelpfully labels the two opposed forces efficiency and effectiveness. I can never remember which is which. Um, uh, Hawkins also talks about uh, efficiency in terms of minimum minimized forms, and Hospelma talks about the trade off of speaker effort and robust information transmission. Um, and Gertz writes, ultimate efficiency would be achieved by a message that costs no energy at all and would therefore sound like this. Um, optimum communicative effectiveness on, on contrast would call for more elaborate messages than time and patience permit. So it's basically Zip's insight. Uh, Kaparsky, within, well, uh, within optimality theory, distinguishes Economy is a form of markedness, avoid complexity, and expressiveness as a form of faithfulness, express meaning. Among equally expressive expressions, the simplest is optimal. Among equally simple expressions, the most expressive is optimal. Um, so going back to something that Hartman mentioned in passing, in my 1972 dissertation, I observed uh, something that I, I pick up the, the thread where Aquinas left off sometime before me. Uh, Aquinas noted that given the square of opposition uh, formulated by the, uh, the Neo-Aristotelians, um, we have a totally symmetrical structure, but in linguistic terms, we have a strong asymmetry. Um, Aquinas points out that where language, that is Latin, has a word for Three, sum, and no, that is nullus. Uh, the uh, particular negative has no corresponding word, although we can express it by negating the universal. So, in terms of English, there's no lexical item null, meaning not all or some not. But that's not a fact about English or a fact about Latin as much as it's a fact about every language ever discovered, every natural language discovered in the world. So why is that? What I argued back in 72 is that languages tend not to lexicalize operators, in particular determiner, quantificational determiners, they're made redundant by scale or implicature. The key observation here is that the sum and sum not mutually implicate each other, all things being equal. Um, and so we don't need lexicalizations for both. It would be more costly than we really want. So to show just how universal it is, well, we can look at the EI and E-type operators, as in this table. Um, notice, for instance, that there's a word in English for both, or one, or either, or neither, um, or um, uh, none of them. Uh, but there's no word, uh, noth meaning not both, or nand meaning not and, or null or null ways. So what we get is that A, I, and E will tend to be better in terms of lexicalization possibilities than, uh, than O. So a system will be better if it permits lexicalization of A, E, and I, but not all four corners. It will be more economical. The same economy principle would predict that you could get a system with um, all, some, and null, not all, and uh, no, or all, none, and, and null, but no word corresponding to some, and yet we never find that. So why is there not only asymmetry, but why does it always go in the same direction? And the answer has to do here with the um, markedness of negation and the fact that negative utterances are harder to learn, harder to process. Uh, they tend to be less lexicalized cross-linguistically. Um, and so um, uh, here's a quote from Hertz uh, about psychologically negative expressions take longer to process, cause more errors, and are harder to retain than positive ones. That's true of monotone decreasing operators in general. So communicative efficiency would prefer a system with three operators rather than four, and the markedness of negation would prefer a system with the positive rather than the negative particular as the lexicalized value. Um, what I want to focus on here is the role of the interplay here between economy or cost on the one hand and informativity on the other, 
where informativity is buttressed by the contribution of scalar implicature. So the debate continues on where and how to allow for ex the extra cost of negation, but a lot of recent work on using computational methods and using typological um, and experimental resources has focused on this interplay of um, complexity and cost, as in these quotes here, maximize um, uh, a trade-off between informativity and some notion of lexical comple complexity, quantifiers optimize the simplicity informativeness trade-off. Uh, within the dialectic of, um, of informativity and cost, there is a, uh, a sub-dialectic. Uh, so, uh, Carcassi and Spardolini recently have talked about how languages, if you keep informativity constant, tend to minimize both com conceptual complexity and usage complexity or um, articulatory complexity. So, you have a trade off between those two forces. What they do here is really rediscover a point that Martinet uh, made sometime earlier. Uh, what he calls paradigmatic economy or economie memorielle versus syntagmatic economy, uh, discursive. Uh, so satisfy the, the trade-off between communicative needs on the one hand and articulatory and mental inertia on the other, the latter two articulatory and men mental inertia in permanent conflict. Um, Okay, so um, this is just a summary of what we saw, so I won't read it. Let me see how much time I have left. I, I'm hope, hopeful that I'm about halfway through. So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm okay. So, so I'll read this. So, uh, so recent work utilizing computational methods drawing on experimental studies has supported and extended the view that the explanation for the three-cornered square of opposition and related asymmetries of lexical expressibility, not just what lexical items are possible, but how easy it is to express these uh, uh, quantificational complexes. Um, it's based on communicative efficiency viewed as the trade-off between informativity given pragmatic enrichment and economy and on the marked character of negation. Um, Another venue for the trade-off is uh, typological and diachronic work on the uh, trade-off between the loss of case marking on the one hand and the rise of fixed word or, uh, word order on the other. And probably all of us have encountered this in one form or another, maybe in Latin class. Um, and um, indeed, word order psychology is a fruitful venue for the dueling drives model. Languages, uh, grammars, uh, Han et al. right, of languages seem to find a balance between two communicative pressures. Yet again, these are the same two pressures. Simple enough to allow the speaker to easily produce sentences, but complex enough to be unambiguous to the hearer. Unambiguous given everything, including intonation, common ground, and so forth. This balance explains well-known word order generalizations across Han et al's study of 51 languages. The original tug of war with distinctness or clarity on the one hand arrayed against laziness, ease, or comfort on the other has gradually, as we see from these quotes, come to be more fruitfully recast in the 20, late 20th and 21st centuries as a trade-off between informativity on the one hand and economy or cost on the other. Um, not necessarily just distinctness or clarity, unless we choose to define clarity in that broad sense. Um, so uh, here is um, uh, Lev Shina, who's uh, written a very interesting book summarizing a lot of work in this area. Language users have a bias toward efficient communication. They tend to minimize the cost to benefit ratio, where the benefits are desirable cognitive effects in the addressee. The costs are related to articulation, processing, and time. Uh, if we have several ways of formulating something, the most efficient expression will be the one with minimal costs under the condition that the same cognitive effects are achieved. And you can actually find a video in which uh, Levshina uh, presents her findings. By definition, a tug of war dialectic has exactly two teams, as we saw in that illustration. Um, 
since Cotius first described the standoff between what we can call team bequemlichkeit, a sufficiency of information linked to the goals of the speaker, and team dortmuchkeit, a least effort a economy. Oops, I forgot to change. Yeah, no, this is that's the bequemlichkeit, which is a least effort uh, principle. So this is a little bit garbled, but you get the idea. We have a picture of communication as an exchange of information as often explicitly presupposed by philosophers and linguists. Um, so Grice talks about how his maxims are stated as if the purpose of discourse were always just a maximally effective exchange of information, but this is too narrow. We need to allow for other purposes. Um, and Stalmaker similarly talks about the point of a discourse. At least one central kind of discourse is the exchange of information. But what if this course is not limited to the exchange of information? So beyond Manichaeism, the expressivity overlay. So this is the second half of the story. So we go back here to the 19th century for an evolutionary twist on Bekfemlichkeit. And here, at least one and hopefully two of these figures will be familiar to us. Um, so as Max, this is Darwin writing uh, about the findings of his frenemy, Max Muller. They had a kind of lifelong uh, approach avoidance relationship. As Muller has well remarked, a struggle for life is constantly going on amongst the words and grammatical forms in each language. The better, the shorter, the easier forms are constantly gaining the upper hand. They owe their success to their own inherent virtue. So much is Muller, now it's Darwin speaking. To these more important causes of the survival of certain words, mere novelty and fashion may be added, for there is in the mind of man a strong love for slight changes in all things. The survival or preservation of certain favored words in the struggle for existence is natural selection. So, Ingemans and Aronoff have elucidated the Muller Darwin exchange. And they both note the proto Zipfian character of Muller's reference to shorter, uh, the easier. But I want to call attention to Darwin's addendum. Beyond the more important causes of the survival of words and grammatical forms, the interplay of ease, and although Darwin doesn't explicitly mention it in formativity, we must admit, Darwin warns, mere novelty, fashion, and the strong love for slight changes in all things. That is, creativity and rhetorical expressivity for its own sake. So looking at expressivity for its own sake, we think immediately of Aristotle, of course, and his notion of onkos, roughly weight or expansiveness, a simple term that resists simple elucidation. Onkos is offered as a goal in itself, weight for the sake of weight. The term evokes an elevation or amplification, both meanings of unkos, that can shade into swelling, bloat, or pompousness, or worse. So unkos is the word for tumor medically and is the root of oncology. Gabalans uh, notes, if only to set it aside, the intervention of the playful and creative side of expressivity overlaid on the Manichaean tug of war between economy and sufficiency in a passage pointed out to me by Martin Haspelmat. So if we disregard those exceptional cases where a playful or artistic sense um, the rights in the formation of speech, language is governed by the economic principle in that the purpose should be achieved with the least possible effort. So here we have three avatars of uh, expressivity. Um, so we begin with uh, Henri Frey. Uh, so uh, Jenny, you will remember Yakov. Uh, uh, and we have Karl Bruno. Uh, so Henri Frey uh, uh, mentions the interplay of three, not two, but three functional besoins, as he called them. We have three, which is essentially the Kremlichkeit principle of economy, um, clarté or differentiation, a counterpart of Deutlichkeit. Then we have expressivité, which is non informational in nature. This is different from what Kaparsky means by expressiveness, which is really another term for clarté. So this is 
uh, this is Frey expressivite, and it's similar, I think, to what uh, Darwin had in mind when, and what uh, Gabalens had in mind with the playful and artistic uh, or ludic forms of language. Uh, these are defined as much by what they don't involve, simple information transfer, as by what they do. Wheeler, in 1930, distinguished Funktionslust, uh, non-goal-oriented activity or pleasure, from Endlust, defined in terms of achievement. The distinction is between goal-directed ex exchanges or actions and those that transcend sheer information transfer and least effort. In his 1934 Spach Theorie, Wieler goes on to describe the key role of the expressive function of language. And more recently, Malkiel also stresses the role of playfulness and its capacity to override both uh, clarity and economy, as Jack Dubois uh, alerted me to. It arises, Malkiel writes, the possibility of elevating playfulness, this is a third color here, to the same kind of pedestal as economy and clarity particularly on the strength of linguistic developments where emotional coloration has been achieved at the expense of economy or clarity or both. I don't see them as all on the same pedestal. I see uh, kind of one pedestal each for economy and uh, clarity. Uh, and then I see hovering above them uh, expressivity. But you're, you, know, you can visualize these as you like. Uh, anthropologist Stephen Miller, who I don't think linguists talk about much, uh, surveys the non-goal-oriented or uh, spielerische uh, nature of uh, play among a variety of species, especially baboons. Play involves repetition and other motor activities that appear as exaggerated or uneconomic in comparison with the form it takes in non-play context, evincing a, a unique galumphing quality. I don't know what the Dutch or French or German counterpart to galumphing is. Think of it in terms of, so this is economy and sufficiency, where I want to sit in the chair and I go up to it and sit like this. Um, and this is galumphing. Okay. So, um, the same lack of, of streamlining or task-oriented efficiency characterizes children's play activity where the center of interest is process rather than goal, not streamlined toward dealing with goals in the shortest possible way, consistent with what you need to do and what you don't have to do, it's voluntarily elaborated, complicated in various ways. So what we're dealing with here is what Hasfelmat, following Keller, has called extravagance. How can the role of expressivity in the creative use of language be reconciled with the principles regulating information exchange the Keller proposes an invisible hand approach. Linguistic change arises as an evolutionary product resulting from the cumulative effect of actions not individually intended as attempts to change the language. Distinguishes sets of static and dynamic maxims regulating conversational exchanges. Some of them are familiar to us, like his, what I'm calling K10, talk in such a way that you do not expend superfluous energy. That's basically effectiveness. Versus K6, talk in such a way that you are noticed, right? No information transfer going on here. Um, so Hasselnod recasts Keller's profit-oriented maxims, in particular K6, as instances of what he calls extravagance, which interacts with the usual distinctness versus economy, or you are dialectic. Yielding a hypermaxim, talk in such a way that you are socially successful at the lowest possible cost. So we have clarity and economy, which we're very familiar with, and then we have extravagance, talk in such a way that you are noticed, which he takes from Keller. Like phrase uh, expressivité, Hasselmatt's third force is superimposed on the interaction of clarity and economy. If being understood were the only goal, extravagance would have no justification. The extravagant speaker is not so much expressing themselves as seeking to uh, impress the hearer. Gertz uh, pushes back against this and uh, suggests that uh, extravagance can't be taken to be M intended in Grice's sense. That would be really okay, I think, for Haspelmat and for Keller because they, they bring up the idea of, um, uh, of, of um, uh, 
Smith's invisible hand here. Uh, so you don't have an individual speaker doesn't have to consciously uh, attempt uh, this end. Uh, so uh, Hertz uh, sees the trade-off between effectiveness and efficiency or clarity and economy as the sole force is needed. But here I'm siding with Hasmalov and saying it's not enough. Uh, Traugott has suggested a mixed position, maintaining a skeptical view on the factor of extravagance as a major factor in language change and arguing for the role of low pragmatic salience in diachronic changes, with, however, an acknowledgment of the role of expressivity or extravagance in lexical innovation. So, like uh, Aristotle's onclose, expressivity and extravagance has its positive and negative uh, sides. Nominal, ex the word extravagance um, as a noun has a pejorative flavor in English, outrageous exaggeration or violence, the OED says. But the adjective extravagant is glossed by the OED as exceeding the bounds of, wait for it, economy or necessity in expenditure. So this is exactly the point that we're getting at here, uh, particularly apt, that is, for the picture of communication advanced by Valence, A, Keller, and Hasbelmat, uh, according to which expressivity can override both economy and clarity. So now I'm going to touch briefly on what I think of as the gymnasium of linguistic change, since it involves cycles and spirals and treadmills, um, beginning with Maye, on the diminution of expressive force resulting in grammaticalization, drawing on the realms of dead metaphors and negation. And you're familiar with this, I think, from historical linguistics. Each time a linguistic element is used, its, it's expressive value diminishes and its repetition becomes easier. Uh, you can't pronounce, you can't step into the same word twice with exactly the same intensity. This is the ordinary effective habit. Uh, but for Maye, this isn't. Um, what Jesperson described as a cycle, but rather a spiral of successive intensification and weakening. A spiral development, languages add auxiliary words to obtain an intense expression. These words gradually weaken, degrade, and fall to the level of simple grammatical tools. New and different words are then needed uh, for the purposes of expression. Weakening recommences and so on without end. Uh, loss of expressive power then arises from the staleness of repetition. Uh, the, the term uh, whose expressivity is worn away weakens to an ordinary grammatical form, grammaticalization in action, form is dingy, uh, defaults. Um, with play, um, what we're dealing with here is a kind of usury. Uh, the law of usury, the more frequently a sign is Use the more blunted are the impressions attached to its form and meaning. Um, the more the sign wears down, the more the need for expressivity, uh, seeking to renew it semantically and formally. More recently, Dahl calls on a different um, uh, economic uh, metaphor, that of inflation, uh, an invisible hand phenomenon. So, in that respect, similar to Keller's, results in loss of expressive value or rhetorical force. High frequency expressions carry a lighter informational load, leading to least effort reduction. And another, a, a classic case in point is the Esperson cycle, the success of weakening, strengthening and weakening shifts in the expression of negation. Weakening, this is Kaparsky and Kandarabdi, but others have said similar things, uh, van der Aura uh, among them. The weakening of expressive or emphatic negation to an ordinary negation goes hand in hand with and is caused by increased frequency of use, again, in the Spirit of zip. Um, classic locus of loss of expressive force is the realm of euphemistic replacement. So this is sometimes called the euphemism treadmill following Pinker, but Cicero and Quine defined it in, in somewhat different words. And Nunberg uses the metaphor of floor wax that you keep having to go over because it, it loses its original effect. So whatever metaphor we use, here's a Here's some foursome of Maye, Cicero, Pinker, and Kate Burridge, who we'll get to in a moment. So for Frey, uh, uh, euphemism and politeness were seen as passive manifestations of the besoin d'exclusivité that attenuate thought or feeling. Uh, and uh, let me move to Kate Burridge. 
Euphemistic expressions often function largely to conceal or disguise the speaker's referential attention, intention, avoiding taboo or respecting negative face, Goffman, Brown, and Levinson. She also notes its robust use to imparting an often artificial dignity, and um, I'm bringing up here Aristotle's Onkos, for this is not a quote, this is a paraphrase, for what I'm calling provocative or ludic motives following Miller and Keller play. For example, it's unlikely that the 18th century expression, the miraculous pitcher that holds water with its mouth downward for vagina, was ever anything but a bit of fun. Burgess' itinerary for euphemism recalls the cyclical pattern of the weakening of the expressive force chronicled by Mayer and Bray, along with the tug of war of Portius, Gabelin, Zip, Jesperson, and company. And here is the way she puts it. In the life of euphemism, wear and tear sees metaphorical links severed, imagery buried, expressions stripped of their force. Uh, the euphemistic turnover is not because time has eroded the euphemistic cover necessarily, because the imposition of routine and associated semantic pragmatic loss has rendered the expression inconspicuous and unremarkable. It is the same tug of war that exists between routinization or idiomatization on the one hand and expressivity or creativity on the other that drives many linguistic innovations. So expressivity or extravagance long invoked as a driving force, a third force as I'm calling it, in language change extends as well to the elements of play within synchronic language use as far back as Gabalens' uh, uh, observation about the, uh, the playful or artistic uh, sense. Uh, so Zwicky and Pullum address these same ludic and aesthetic elements in language use surveying a range of ostentatious and whimsical devices and rules governing phenomena that occupy a domain orthogon orthogonal to the grammar. Grammar, schmammer, that's, that's one of the kinds of cases in, in mind. Conceptualizing the expressive functions as overlaid on the basic system, mirroring the characterization of expressivity expounded by Gabalens and company. Uh, so here's a quote from Zwicky and Pullum, closely related to the artistic use of language is the playful use of language in secret languages, riddling, punning, insult games, and the link, uh, and, and the like, sorry, uh, just as the restrictions and deviations of poetic language are extraordinary from the point of view of uh, the grammar of prosaic language, so are the deformations, extensions, and restrictions found in verbal play. Like schemes of poetic form, these constitute an overlay on the basic linguistic system. I don't think I'm disagreeing with Mark in discussing interjections, which would figure in this category. It's part of the system, but there's still a distinction made between the basic system and the overlay. So we can argue about, about whether that's a, a fair uh, characterization. So we have Zwicky, we have Pullum. Um, and we have two other figures who I'll be coming to. Between linguistic play and straightforward communication is what Chris Barker calls reductively, or roughly, sorry, semi-productive word formation, which he illustrates by E suffix nominals like fantasize, uh, which can be invented on an ad hoc basis when needed. Uh, I've talked about English unnouns like an unpolitician and unverbs like unfriend, um, and lexical clones, um, or contrastive focus or duplication, which I'll come to in a minute, as instances of these uh, semi-productive uh, word formation tendencies. And lexical clones, a word or phrase, is doubled in English and other languages that work in similar ways to form a modifier head construction, sometimes a compound, not always, the meaning tends to narrow to a prototype meaning, uh, as in a doctor doctor, not a PhD in linguistics, a salad salad, not a tuna or a chicken salad, uh, to intensification, tall tall, not just medium tall, or to literality, dog dog, not a hot dog or an unattractive person, dead dead, not just brain dead. Uh, so I've described these in a couple of papers, and I cite some other people. There is actually a nice collection um, that uh, was recently contributed on this. Um, so 
uh, the speaker leans on the context here to convey the type of narrowing intended, which may be indeterminate. So we have exchanges like this one reported by a Yale undergraduate. Uh, hook up in American English can mean anything from meet to have sex, penetrative sex, and anything in between. So A asks, did you hook up? He responds, yeah, we hooked up. A, did you hook up, hook up? He responds, nah, we just hooked up, hooked up. Okay, so hook up, hook up in, in the first case is more than, than just meeting. And in the second case, uh, sorry, so, so that's what they're, they're asking about, but th these end up meaning exactly the same thing. We didn't hook up, hook up, and we just hooked up, hooked up. So a friend, friend, similarly, or in German, Freund, Freund, is either just a pal or a friend plus at what's sometimes called an um, friend, as in, grandma, I'd like you to meet my um, friend. Um, so this is a romantic partner, friend with benefits, depending again on the context and co-text. Uh, Kentner recently has uh, talked about these clones in terms of extravagant repetition. Um, in languages like English and German, when reduplication is not used for purely uh, grammatical purposes, exact repetition it's may express a disorderly mixed bag of secondary expressive, effective, or evaluative meanings that range from typicality, emphasis, or normality to slight disdain, jocular, or affectionate depreciation. Almost exactly 100 years earlier, Vandrias had written about repetition as an instance of expressivity lost or gained given how expressive or effective constructions can develop into simple grammatical devices. An expression, he writes, with the force of um, the paroxysma, paroxysm, as signaled by a repeated adjective, say boo, boo, um, can shed its emotive force, becoming a purely grammatical superlative in a given language. In other cases, such as the French, or we can say English lexical clone, repeated adjective retains its expressive force, Whence the difference between the, the members of this minimal pair, which is Vandrias's own, il n'est pas joli joli, isn't handsome handsome, versus il n'est pas très joli, uh, he isn't very handsome. Why should a device like exact reduplication or cloning exist within a communicative system when it violates both clarity, given the contextual variation and uncertainty of interpretation, as we've just seen, and economy, given the extra effort involved in enunciating XX uh, as well as X, and the mental economy, which is violated by um, having to, um, uh, to, to come up with XX. So the, the, the answer is language does not live by clarity and economy alone. Another case in point is logical double negation. So I'm not talking here about negative concord about the kinds of negations that supposedly cancel out. In negating a contrary, like not unhappy, the two negatives would be expected semantically not to cancel out. I can be not unhappy with a proposal you know, without being happy with it. So there's a reason why we would say not unhappy rather than happy. But what does the extra effort be behind saying not on X add beyond a simple utterance of X when un X is a contradictory that you're denying rather than a contrary. So to take a case in point then, I'm not unhappy is predictably different from un, um, happy. Um, it's not uncommon is predictably distinct from it's common given that things can be neither common nor uncommon, people can be neither happy nor unhappy. Why would we say that something is not impossible? What can something be if it's not impossible other than possible? You're denying impossible. Impossible is the contradictory of possible. Similarly, not incompatible. What do they tell us that the simple positive doesn't? In fact, there are a range of different motivations involved for what appears to be an extravagant violation of economy in keeping with the general principle encapsulated by Steve's M principle and what I call the division of pragmatic labor stipulates that marked situations tend to be conveyed by marked forms. Uh, that you're, if you go out of your way to say something in a more complex way, there's always a reason for it, but it's not necessarily the same reason. 
this is something I've explored with double negation, but I was far from the first. So rhetoricians and grammarians have um, expressed over the centuries, really going back to the Renaissance um, uh, rhetoricians like uh, Puttenham, uh, uh, to logical double negation. Uh, George Orwell, um, not on should be driven from the language, although uh, I've remarked in a paper that Orwell used uh, not on very frequently in his own writing without apparently being aware of that. He writes, banal statements are given an appearance of profundity with the not unformation. We should laugh the not unformation out of existence, memorizing the sentence, a not unblack dog is chasing a not unsmall rabbit across a not ungreen field. Of course, as we know, he's really uh, stacking the deck here against the not unconstruction. A, a very different stylist, um, Henry Fowler, was more generously inclined towards the not unconstruction. He says, the very popularity of this idiom in English is proof that there is something in it congenial to the English, that is the British English temperament. It is pleasant to believe that it owes its success with us, at least the upper crust uh, Englishman that he has in mind here, uh, to a stubborn dislike of putting things too strongly. As a marker of Englishness um, and or class, not an appeal to Henry Fowler and irritated George Orwell precisely because of its indirection. But as with the two sides of Aristotelian onkos, or grandiloquence, pomp for the sake of pomp, or as a marker of elevated style, there are occasions on which a speaker violates economy, or crisis brevity, precisely to violate economy. This is the very nature of extravagance. On the sociolinguistic side, both extravagant repetition and extravagant double negation also reflect the pragmatic undertaking by the speaker to invite the hearer to compute the intended specific meaning based on the context of utterance and prior discourse. If successful, expressivity in such cases serves a key function of social meaning, as we saw with the Fowler quote, the coordination between speaker and hearer, as with other expressive utterances, including reclaimed epithets and slurs, the interlocutors are linked by a shared understanding or shared complicity. So now, conclusion. Linguistic expressivity revisited. Expressivity plays a double role in linguistic form and linguistic change. As Frege taught us, ex ex speakers utilize expressions that contribute aspects of meaning in the broad sense without affecting the reference or sense of the sentences in which they appear. Lexical items, bound morphemes, grammatical constructions often express attitudes uh, sometimes referred to as non at issue content toward addressee or referent, in many cases revealing intentionally or not a specifically negative or deprecatory attitude. Analysts from Frege and Dummett to Kaplan, Potts, and Gutzmann take these expressives, as in that damn plenary has gone on too long, um, to be overlaid on descriptive content operating on a distinct tier from descriptive at issue content. Just as use conditional, following Kaplan and, and Gutzmann, and non at issue expressive elements contribute meanings that are overlaid on descriptive or truth conditional content, so too there's a broader sense in which expressivity, viewed as the third force in lexical choice and language change, is overlaid on the tug of war between the two great functions of speaker ordered uh, oriented economy or least effort and pure oriented clarity or informativity. Communication hangs on the balance between these forces in many ways, as Frey argues, is this superimposed drive for expressivity or extravagance that turns a static equilibrium dynamic. And I believe, oh, that's almost it. This drive and its effects can be detected in the push and pull of Jesperson cycle and Mayer's spiral of strengthening and weakening, and the treadmill of euphemism and the playfulness of expressive morphology, and in the appeal of lexical clones, logical double negation, and other constructions that challenge both property and economy. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Larry, for a wonderful talk. Pleasure. And, uh, nice to have uh, e extravagance uh, <laughs> imposed upon efficiency. Um, and it was also wonderful to have uh, an antidote to our diachronic myopia. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm now opening uh, the floor to questions. Ooh, uh, Jürgen Jaspers here will run to uh, William Beeman in the front. So. Oh, well, hang on, yes. William. Uh, well, wait, two, two people are speaking simultaneously. But... <laughs> overlap, Mark. There's, there's a overlap. Use... Hello? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful talk. It was uh, just uh, 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 an, a paragon of, uh, of erudition, and I, I really, really did appreciate all the work that was put into it. It was wonderful. I do have a question about extravag I do have a question about extravagance, and that is that at, uh, at, in some, uh, certainly in some discourse styles, extravagance is absolutely necessary mm -hmm. absolutely necessary or else it is considered to be impolite mm -hmm. uh in a particular in uh, particularly in situations where you you have um uh, discourse toward the people of uh of higher rank or higher status uh and you uh you fail to mm. you fail to use this extravagant language it will be taken amiss and you so it's a requirement it's not uh not just to get noticed, it's to avoid punishment, actually, avoid social punishment. And social social success, it's a form of social success. I, I, I take your point, and I think that, uh, I mean, partly we can talk about conventionalization. Uh, so, the again, this the, the spiral where, you know, it's not, you're not being noticed as being especially polite. You're just being uh, noticed as not breaking the rules. Of, of you know polite discourse, and it's not an accident. And this is something that that uh, a number of people, uh, Jeffrey Leach, for instance, has has written about. Uh, it's not an accident that circumlocution is is generally the form taken by politeness, whereas brusqueness is seen as its complementary other half. It's hard to imagine a language in which the more circumlocution you use, the ruder you're taken to be, and vice versa. Uh, so this is something that we would expect to find cross linguistically, but the degree and the kinds of uh, of politeness phenomena that we observe will vary from not just language to language, but subculture to subculture within languages. And it's also an aerial feature, for instance, Southeast Asia, you know, across different um, unrelated languages. So thanks a lot. Thank you for a very stimulating talk, which didn't go on too long at all. <laughs> just long enough. <laughs> yeah, That's just sure long either. enough. So, um, Mike, you know, you set up this tug of war between clarity versus brevity or economy versus mm -hmm. um, informativeness and so on, uh, and then proceeded to dismantle it. Um, the thought which uh, came to my mind is looking at your um, line up from Aristotle and Quintilian mm -hmm. all the way down to Steve, um, is that it was within one cultural tradition. True. But, uh, you know, I come from a country where there is a long tradition of Sanskrit grammarians uh, discussing the same questions. And, my, uh, and in that case, the um, tradition comes down very strongly in favor of brevity, mm -hmm. uh, so much that they extravagantly say uh, saving half a syllable is for a grammarian mm -hmm. as uh, uh, worthy of rejoicing as the birth of a son. Okay. So in that case, why do they privilege economy of expression or brevity as opposed to mm. informativeness and it is precisely because be panini, panini etc uh, the grammarians and the rhetoricians so what they say is you have a grammarian who works for 20 years on a particular topic and then boils it down to six gnomic utterances mm -hmm. which are very very brief Mm -hmm. 
the point is that this creates a space for a hearer oriented interpretation. So you may, because the nomic utterance requires lots and lots and lots of grammatical. So my question is, is the principle of uh, brevity accommodative to a hearer oriented principle uh, of interpretation? Thank and you. that is another way of framing a similar problem from another tradition. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, what, one issue for me is distinguishing uh, economy in the language from economy in the grammar. And, and part of what Panyini, I thought, was, was trying to do is to come up with the most elegant possible description. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I think in, in that case, uh, there is the tradition that is in, in our culture, especially associated with mathematics, where mathematics dissertations can be a page and a half, whereas linguistics dissertations are 200 to 300 words, and literature dissertations can go well beyond that. So depending on the subculture, there is a, a love of um, ellipsis and economy and purity that mathematicians capture and that Arnini was, was also interested in capturing in, in, within his grammatical tradition. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering whether the language itself was viewed as uh, obeying laws of uh, economy to a greater extent than, than you know, the, the language described by English grammarians is, or whether it was just the grammatical tradition. I, I don't you know much more about that than I do. So. Right. Oh, others, yeah. Thank you. Okay, one question, and then another one. Right now. Okay. Hey, very briefly, uh, there is a lot to think about in your talk for me, but uh, I wanted to uh, to ask whether uh, you do make or you don't make uh, certain assumptions that uh, are, uh, I disagree with. I probably do make them, and I'm wrong. I would, I would like to understand that. One is the idea that playful speech is not goal-oriented. I think that most playful speech is goal-oriented. For example, uh, we, if we tell a joke within a conversation, we tell it for some reason mm -hmm. and to communicate something or to suggest something or to create some kind of relationship within that conversation. So it's, it is goal-oriented. And uh, it's the same for creative metaphor in poetry and like that. And second, um, but it is also related, um, do you suggest that uh, 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 we violate economy sometimes just to, to viol violate it yes. or just to violate a common uh, with the mm. mere uh, goal to violate it to break the rule of economy uh, I, I, my impression is that in those cases that mean that may seem to be uh, violations of economy for their own sake we actually communicate or convey some kind of fuzzy or vague meaning and open a space for negotiation. Yes, I, I don't think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that clarifies a, a couple of points that, that I was trying to cover. I, I don't uh, disagree with your characterization. I think part of it is a question of what we mean by goal-oriented and what we mean by full uh, and artistic, the, the, the point is that the two are not necessarily in conflict with each other. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I do take the point from my, the predecessors that I quoted that sometimes um, we say what we say because we do want to be noted and are noticed and admired and held in high esteem by our conversational interlocutors it is to, to be sure always a reason for what we say, and I think that goes back to the, uh, the, what I try to uh, capture with the division of pragmatic labor, that the 
the marked forms, which are longer and sometimes um, less apparently less informative or at least pointless, uh, always do have a point, although what point it is depends on the individual case. So sometimes you're making a semantic distinction uh, that isn't obvious. Sometimes there's no difference in the, in the semantics, uh, but there is in the pragmatic. So when you really control cases, like take the, the not impossible or it's not inconceivable, which suggests a lower point on the scale from being possible. So we say things like, it's possible or at least not impossible, but we can't say the opposite. It's not impossible or at least possible. Why is that? Well, it's always weaker to use the longer form, but we could never say that verb is transitive or at least not intransitive. That really, you know, you, you really have to, you know, uh, you know, hold your head for that one because it's not at all clear in what way we can coerce a distinction between being transitive and being not intransitive. Uh, whereas for very human things like the, you know, the possibilities that we encounter in our life or the conceivability that we have with an idea, it's not that hard to imagine a situation in which something can be less possible than possible in effect. And that's what the not impossible tells us. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think there is, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that there, that these are all oriented in a broad sense, but if we draw the distinction between, for instance, at issue and non at issue, meaning maybe it's, you know, an oversimplified axial distinction, but it's one which often turns out to be useful in our characterization of linguistic devices, then we can say, we can, you know, sort of divvy up and we can kind of say splitters rather than lumpers to, the, to that extent and, and provide reasons for why speakers something that looks like it's silly, but that people all over the world do, nevertheless. So thanks, Marina. Okay, last question. Please be brief rather than explicit. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Your second Unless you're your second Marina. 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 Another Marina. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Marina. Marina. As usual, you gave us a very sort of all-encompassing, almost all-encompassing sure. time travel. Um, I, I, I must say something about those uh, triumvirates that uh, kept coming back or quadrumvirates. I only noticed two women, Kate Berridge and Elizabeth Traugott. I hope we can work to change that. I understand why they were there, but not enough women featured. Um, but here's the question. So you put um, clarity versus economy. Uh, it was your starting point, added expressivity as the umbrella that may tie those together. And I think towards the end, you were almost gonna answer the question that was on, in my head through that time. I see at least two other dimensions, um, two other pressures, and I wonder what you think about them. One would be the more argumentative kind of pressures mm. that uh, Sperber and Mercier have talked about, which are very much about, um, to put it, very simply convincing an interlocutor. So they go beyond expressivity, beyond clarity, beyond economy. Mm -hmm. It's about that kind of solid performative force, but argumentative, I think, is the better term. Um, and the one I'm more, even more interested possibly about uh, in uh, is a kind of, for lack of a better term, um, social belonging identity, identification. Uh, I hate those. Uh, the the point is that um, routinization doesn't just amount to loss of meaning. I think one of your last quotes made that point. Um, social meaning cannot emerge until there is conventionalization. And the social meaning is all about group belonging. And therefore, there has to be a loss of expressivity uh, for uh, an expression to acquire that possibility to indicate something about uh, the users in the listener's ears, group belonging. So I missed social uh, meaning, so to speak, and argumentative meaning as additional dimensions in your schema. I was yeah, very yeah. No, I, I think them. I think I, I may have gone over it quickly, but I, I thought the uh, the quote that I took from Burridge, uh, maybe a couple of the others, um, tried to make that point, uh, which is that um, you know, the 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 interplay of um, Routinization uh, and social meaning. 
I, yeah, the tug of war that exists between regionization or idiomatization on the one hand and expressivity or creativity on the other that drives many linguistic innovations. So she's not saying what you're saying, but I think it's in this framework that we can make sense out of that idea. I, I, I think certainly the tendency to use forms that index our own relations with our interlocutors, with um, uh, the ratify overhearers and with the society more generally, um, uh, take into account uh, the, um, the function of, uh, of, of using these expressions like, like a slur in a context in which it's clear uh, to the here that you don't intend the deprecatory attitudes that normally go with, with slur. So what else is going on? Well, you're indicating without saying it that we're in this together, we in group, and those other people out there are gonna misinterpret what we say. Irony works that way as well, I think. So I'm mean, not answering your question, but it's, it's food for thought. So thanks, Marina. With that, I think we have to bring things to a close. I can see we're running out of air, people. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. So there's the reception in just a quarter of an hour. Just time for a pit stop, and then we'll see you in the reception. <laughs>